Good preaching. Be not discouraged. Good, good. Thank you. Psalm 37 in your Bibles. We'll begin there tonight. Get your Bibles ready to turn some pages this evening as we look at this theme of eternal security. Eternal security. And if you'll notice that these are the foundations of our faith. The foundations of our faith. We obviously know what foundation means. It means we can't build anything else until we have a foundation. Last week we talked about salvation. Obviously that's where it all begins. You know for sure if you died today that you would go to heaven. Maybe even tonight there might be one or there might be two or more. I don't know. You might be here and you say, you know what? I honestly do not know if I died today that I would go to heaven. That's the very first foundational uh, piece that you need to put into your life's puzzle is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And then number two in our series, and probably as in the area of importance as well, is the peace of eternal security. Eternal security. Now, I have talked to many people throughout uh, my life of witnessing and soul winning and, and, and in my adult life especially even more. And uh, there have been several people every year, it seems like, that struggle with this truth. They struggle with the truth and the, the, the biblical teaching of eternal security. I'm going to tell you the reason why I personally believe a lot of people struggle with eternal security. It's because their salvation was not based solely on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Their salvation was based on them and something else on top of that. And any time you add something to the grace of God, you are now dangerously entered into an area of where you can be susceptible to not realizing that you're saved once and for all. I remember talking to someone at the SkyTrain one time, and, and I'm not, this isn't the time to discuss this particular doctrine. We've talked about it here before. But I talked to someone at the SkyTrain one time who told me, you will not be in heaven unless you speak in tongues. And I said to this gentleman, I said, sir, I'm not really up for an argument today. But I can tell you right now, I've never spoken tongues unless I didn't really know that I, I, I tried to speak Spanish a few times, maybe. And, but sorry, those of you that speak Spanish, I didn't do your language justice. And I know Brother Ahmad's tried to teach me a little bit of Farsi through the years, but, you know, I, I, you know I've stammered through that so many times. And then the Filipino brethren and sisters have taught me a few things, but, you know, that's about the only speaking in tongues this boy's ever done. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, sir, but I take offense to that statement because I've never spoken tongues like what you're talking about. And, and quite honestly, what he was talking about isn't what the Bible's talking about anyway. And this isn't the time or the place for that. But unfortunately, I've met a lot of people that have experienced salvation. Uh, more of, it's more of an experience or it's not based on Scripture that struggle with this thing of eternal security. And God did not save you, or God did not save me, so that one week we could feel saved, and the next week we could feel lost, and feel saved one time during our life, and then lost the next. So the Bible's very clear that eternal security is something that God has for us. I want to just start off with this introductory verse. It's not in your notes, but it's a verse that I find to be very helpful to me. And you're, you're probably in Psalm 37 by now. Look in verse number 28. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. Do you know tonight that if you are born again, you are considered a saint? This is not given to really uh, moral people that live their lives and die and then they're given sainthood. This is what the Bible calls us as believers. We are already saints tonight, those of us that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. The Bible says here that the Lord, in verse number 28, the Lord does not forsake his saints. But notice the next phrase, they are preserved, how long? Forever. Forever. Now this is just one introductory verse that really is helpful to me as we think about this eternal security. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. 
So we obviously know then what seed will not be cut off, and that is the seed of the righteous, those that are saved, those that are saints. We are preserved not by our good works, not by who we are, but we are preserved forever by the Lord. So tonight, if you are a born-again child of God, by way of introduction, let me just say, number one, you are a saint, and number two, you have been preserved forever by the Lord. Now, let's go now to the, to the uh, New Testament in John chapter number 10. You say, Pastor Turner, you know, a lot of these verses and things I've heard a lot over my Christian experience, my Christian life, and I would say to that, yes, I have too. But you know what? There's a twofold reasoning in giving these as a church, just in case you were wondering. Number one, it's because repetition is always the key to learning. Yes. There's, there's, never in, there's nothing in this Bible that we could never hear too much of. And number two, it's not so that you can just say, well, I've already heard this before. It's so that you can be equipped maybe a little bit more sharper to be able to help someone else. Because again, they may not be a part of Anchor Baptist Church, but there might be somebody you come across someday. It might be in another place of Canada. It might be in another place around the world. It might be at your place of employment. And they're struggling with, well, I think I'm saved. I might be saved. And see, these scriptural principles that, that, that are in this lesson tonight that are from God's word, we need to be able to take someone and say, well, if, what, did you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Well, yes, I made that decision and such. As, okay, then let me show you some things from the Bible to help you with this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what we've heard already this evening. Thank you for the encouragement to, to not be discouraged. You've won the battle. Lord, we're so thankful for that. Lord, you've called us to be your ambassadors. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that we would listen attentively to the Spirit of God, that we be challenged from the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. In John's Gospel in the 10th chapter, we read much about the good shepherd. It talks about the shepherd of the sheep there in this verse. And familiar, again, verses of Scripture to us, but familiar verse of Scripture that we give with regards to this. The question that's listed is, what is eternal security? We're on page number two. What is eternal security? John 10, 27, the Bible says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. Notice that, notice eternal life. Now, last time I checked, eternal life means forever. So God gives us eternal life. It is forever, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So the notes say that eternal security is God's guarantee that we are saved forever. So tonight, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, we use the term eternal security, meaning that you are saved forever. Secondly here, we see in 1 Peter 1, 5, who are kept how? By the power of God. I mean, you might want to underline that in your notebook there, or you might want to circle that in your notebook there, that tonight many people, again, have, have, have said, well, I'm holding on to God. My friend, it's not you holding on to God. You aren't kept by you holding on to God. I've got slippery fingers, folks. I've let a lot of things slide through my fingers. And every once in a while, I, I probably would have let God's hand slip through my fingers by now. The Bible says here, I'm not kept by my power. I'm not kept by my might. I'm kept by the power of God. And so in relation to our eternal security, we are not kept by anyone's power, but we are kept by the power of God through faith. Again, we talked about that this morning, that uh, faith is foundational, uh, that, we, that we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's foundational faith, salva saving faith, we call it, unto salvation. God will save and keep anyone who places their faith in the finished work of Christ. So eternal security is the promise of God that I am saved forever. It is the guarantee of God that I am saved forever. Nextly, how can we be confident that our salvation is forever? Where do we get this confident? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5, please. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, number 1, salvation is eternal. How can we believe that my, that, that my salvation is forever? 
Well, salvation is eternal. Hebrews 5, 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. He became the author of eternal salvation. Again, who came up with salvation? God loved you and God loved me. John 3, 16. He is the author. He is the finisher of our faith. This is not a concept that any man could have ever came up with. This is something that God himself came up with for you and for me. And he, and he even talked about it in the Garden of Eden right away when man fell there in Genesis chapter number 3. It is eternal. Secondly, how can I be confident my salvation is forever? Number two, I must choose to believe God's promise. You have a choice to make. Is God who he says he is? Will God do what he says he will do? John 14, 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. Again, Jesus Christ speaking there. You're in Hebrews. Let's go back to this one in 1 John 2. We aren't going to be able to go through all of these verses because this is a little bit longer lesson um, tonight. I'm not going to rush, but we're not going to be able to look up all of them. That's why you can take this home with you, and you can even do a little bit more study on your own. And I would encourage you to do that, by the way. 1 John 2, 25, the Bible says, And this is the promise that he hath promised us. So we've got promise twice. This is the promise that he hath promised us. And what is the promise? Eternal life. This is a promise from God. We must choose to believe God's promise. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. They're all yours. They're all mine. But we, we, got, we have to make a conscious decision with our head down to our heart that God's promises are true. And once I am saved, and the reason why we've got to make this from the head to the heart is going to be covered later in the lesson. And I think you probably know what that means. Number three, God's promise is greater than my doubt. For our heart, if our heart condemn us, how many of you tonight, your heart has ever condemned you? Raise your hand. By the way, that's everybody in the room. Sorry, that's a trick question. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the part where you know you're a sinner. I think everybody in this room knows we're a sinner. And I think even after we get saved, there's times in our life where we think, how could I be saved? Have you ever thought that as a Christian? How could I be saved and be unkind to my spouse like this? Right? Right. Amen. Come on, guys. you got to help me here. How could I be saved and talk back to my parents like that? Amen? Amen. How could I be saved and not read my Bible? Oh, ouch. See, our heart does condemn us. How could I be saved and not be willing to give out the gospel? I mean, goodness, if I'm saved, I'm going to be willing to do this. But I'll tell you, all of these things are good to do or not good to do, depending. I, I did say talking about talking uh, uh, bad to our spouse, but those aren't good to do. But all of these things we've struggled with in our life and many others, and our heart condemns us. See, that's why we need to understand that God is greater than our heart. And he knoweth all things. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 20. To doubt is normal. But I've highlighted this in my notes. The devil will provoke us to doubt. Just like he did in the Genesis chapter 3. We mentioned that earlier today. Believe me, the devil, if, if God is about faith, then what's the devil about? The opposite of that, doubt. He's camping out on your doorstep. He's camping out on my doorstep, waiting for us to make any kind of a blunder at all. And he's right there saying, yeah, and you call yourself a Christian. Come on. You're the sorriest excuse for a Christian I've ever tried to plant doubt in, in the heart and ever in the history of the world. Maybe he doesn't go quite that far. But he's trying to plant doubt in my heart. You call yourself uh, 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 someone who, who's a pastor. You call yourself this a Sunday. You, 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 I mean, he, he attacks us all the time. I mean, you wear a shirt and tie, and you dress up nice for the Lord, and, and you, but yet you call yourself a Christian. 
We know those don't make us good Christians. But you know what I mean. I mean, we do everything that we think we can do. And then as soon as we make a mistake, buddy, I'll tell you, the devil's right there to plant a seed of doubt in you. He's the father of all what? Lies. Remember that. And when he comes to you and he comes to me as God's children, don't forget who he is. He's a liar and the father of it. Don't forget it. By the way, when he comes to you and he comes to me to tempt us into sin, don't forget who he is. He promises that this thing will take you this way. Remember, he's a liar and the father of it. If he promises this or that, remember, he never tells the whole truth. He'll give a little bit of truth and a lot of lie. That's why we need to make sure be in this book, be in this book, be in this book, be in this book. This book will help you and me to identify the lies of the devil. Stay in the word of God. God's promise is greater than our doubt. Notice this phrase, and we'll turn the page to four. If we waver and doubt, we are still saved because God's promise is greater than our doubt. Just remember, God's promise is greater than our doubt. Page four, how can we be confident that our salvation is forever? Number four, confidence grows by our understanding and believing God's promise. 1 John 5.20 is listed for you there. If, you're, if you don't have a book in front of you, 1 John 5.20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and what? Eternal life. Let's let that phrase sink in just a little bit here. Number four, confidence grows by our understanding and believing God's promise. How do you think we're going to understand and believe and, and know more about God's promises? How do you think that's going to happen? It's going to happen as we're in the word of God more and more and more. You know how else it's going to happen? You say, Pastor, you say this every week. I know I do. And I need it every week. I don't know about you, but I'm saying it for me. You know, what, you know, you know how we get to know more and more about the promises of God? Being faithful to the house of God. When we're faithful, faithful to the house of God, we hear something from the word of God. We hear something in the singing. We hear a testimony. We hear it in our Sunday school class. And it helps us to understand our confidence grows and grows and grows by our understanding and following God's promises. Number five, salvation is not earned by our works, kept by our works, or lost by our works. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as unclean thing, as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. God has paid the price through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the finished work of Calvary. So when it comes to keeping our salvation, we don't keep, we can't keep our salvation. Yes, there's something that we ought to be a part of, and that is sanctification. That's becoming more like Christ. But my friends, everyone here this evening, no matter when you got saved, whether that be five years ago or ten years ago or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, we are all trying to grow toward the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we are going to fail. My salvation is not determined by my failures or lack thereof. My salvation is determined by my faith and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why there's, you can't allow the enemy to come to you and try to plant these seeds of doubt into your mind that, man, you're, you're not this or you're not that. Hey, tell the devil, you know what? You're right. I'm none of those things. But you know what I am, devil? I'm a child of the king. Jesus is my Savior. I trusted him as my Savior. I'm not anything that you just said. You're right, but I know Jesus loves me. And just start quoting the word of God, and the devil will flee from you. Believe me, there's been times in my life, I'm not saying I saw the devil. I don't know what he looks like. And by the way, he doesn't have any uh, horns or tail. That isn't what the devil looks like. In fact, he looks very nice, actually, for more than likely. He's an angel. He was an angel of light. He's very beautiful. I've never seen the devil. I probably never will. But I'll tell you this. I know I felt his presence or one of his demons' presence. 
I, I'll tell you, there's been times where I just know that I don't know how many there were. I don't know if there was a battle going on above me, beside me, behind me. But I just know there was spiritual warfare going on around me. And I know that there's been times in my life where, where, where even, even I started to think things uh, that like, like maybe I'm not saved. You say, you, you've got that? Sure I have. I've begun to, there's been things that have come into my head. And you know what I do? I'll tell you, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm, I don't cast demons out or anything like that. But I'll tell you this right now. I just start quoting the word of God. And I'll tell you this, there's something about the power of the word of God. The devil can't stand it. It's sharper and it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's amazing. About one verse or two is about all it takes. And then all of a sudden, those thoughts are gone. The fear's gone. Why? Because the word of God. They can't stand around when the word of God comes out. So let me encourage you, your confidence and my confidence grows by the understanding and believing of God's promises. And also understand that we do not earn our salvation, we do not keep our salvation, and we don't lose our salvation by our works or lack thereof. Number six, our confidence is in whom we believe. We talked about this this morning. Our confidence must be in whom we believe, not in what we believe. But it's in whom we believe. Whom refers to a person, right? You have the scripture there. 2 Timothy 1, 2. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep. That's a key word. Again, he is able to keep. Maybe you circle that uh, word in your notes there. That which I have committed unto him against that day, the day of Christ. So, tonight, try to think back on the time when you got saved. Think back right now. Praise the Lord for salvation. Amen? Amen. Think back on the time you got saved. Think back on the time when the, when the Holy Spirit of God convicted you that you were a sinner. By, because everyone in this room is a sinner. Think back on the time when you realized that your sin had separated you from a holy God. And that, that if you died in your sin, full state that you were in, that you would go straight to the lake of fire. And you would spend eternity in the lake of fire forever. And then you heard the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, got, you, you heard that Jesus loved you. And you heard that he died on the cross for you. And you turned from your unbelief. And you turned to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you put your full faith and trust in him. That was a great day, wasn't it? That was a great day when you got saved. Who saved you on that day? You? No, God saved you. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. For me, it was April 1983 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I committed my eternal destiny to the Lord Jesus Christ that day. Now, you know what? He's been keeping it all this time. However many years that is. I lost track. 30 years maybe, almost. 31 years coming up this April. He's been keeping it the entire time. I'll tell you, I haven't been the Christian that I should, should have been over the last 31 years. But he's been the Savior he promised he would be every one of those 31 years. He's been keeping my salvation. And when is he keeping it till? Against that day, the day of Christ. Whether I, when I die or whether when Christ returns, that salvation is mine. It's an eternal, it's a present, uh, it's a current condition. It's a present possession, that's what I was thinking of. Um, number seven here, let's go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, we are confident of our salvation, number seven, because the whole debt has been paid. Isaiah chapter 53. We'll read verse 10 as well. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, and thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Notice this. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's it. That's that book that we have in the back that we give to all of our guests. Done. 
It's done. He's been satisfied. How is he satisfied? By the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, by, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Another verse I'd like to take you to, it's not listed there, maybe you want to jot it down, is Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We are confident of our salvation because the whole debt, the entire debt has been, fit, has been paid. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Genesis 3, right? The offense of one. Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. It's paid for. It's completely paid for. One Savior, one Lord, one Christ, one Jehovah, he paid the price. He paid it all. So tonight my confidence is not in any one. My confidence is in, is in whom I know I have believed. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's completely paid. It's not partially paid. It's entirely paid. Jesus took on him all the wrath I deserved. Again, I was mentioning that last Sunday night. Can you imagine just the wrath in this room alone? I don't know how many people are in this room tonight, but we're all sinners. Can you think about, can you just think about that for a minute? Just the wrath of God that should have been poured on this room and this room right now. Just our group tonight. You, you, we, can't even, we can't even put that and think about that. Believe me, it's nothing I can handle and it's nothing you can handle. The wrath of God being poured out on us. Just think. Of that times, however many people have ever lived. All of that wrath. I don't know how much it would have been. A lot. It was poured out of the Lord Jesus Christ. On Calvary's cross. And we wonder. Why God could not look at him. It is no wonder why God could not look at him. When you think about just the wrath that would have been needed for this one room let alone the billions and billions of people that have been born from eternity past until it's all over. It's no wonder that God had to turn his back on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you consider the wrath that was poured out on him, all of it was poured out on him. And what should that do? It should cause us tonight to bow our knees in praise and thanksgiving to Almighty God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid everything, all of my debt, all of your debt. How much do we appreciate that, brother, sister? How much do we appreciate that? How do we appreciate that? We appreciate that by giving him the only thing we have ourselves he doesn't want your money he doesn't want my money he doesn't want my talent he doesn't want my abilities i mean those come later on he wants my heart he wants my decisions he wants my will he wants me to lay it all down and how can we deny him that when he took my wrath that i deserve and he put it on Christ. How can I say with the utmost uh, cockiness, this is my life, God? How can I get to that point? It's amazing what pride will do to a person. It's amazing what pride will do to me. It'll do to you. It'll make us say that to God who poured out his wrath on Jesus that I deserved. Oh, my goodness. God says, I just want your heart. And we say, no, can't have that. just says just give me your life just give me your will what a wonderful savior we have it is true can I lose my salvation page six 
can I lose my salvation? Well, the obvious answer that we've kind of been talking about is no. There is nothing we can do to lose our salvation. John chapter number 6. John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. This is a, I, I've used this phrase many, many times, but not the first part of the verse. And I'm sorry about that. You should probably learn the whole thing. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. John 10, 29. My, it's in your notes. My father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. There is nothing that we can do to lose our salvation. Let's quickly go through these, and we'll make application maybe in a minute. Number two, no, because God cannot lie. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised. What did God promise? Eternal life. So if God promised it, it's, it's, it's going to happen. You can count on it. Number three, God's word clearly says, says clearly we can know that we have eternal life. 1 John 5, 12 and 13, he that hath the Son hath life. So, again, the question is tonight, are you saved? Do you have the Son? Because if you have the Son, you have eternal life. But he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, that ye may know that, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Number four, God seals or guarantees my salvation with his Holy Spirit. Now, this is a point where I'm going to stop for just a moment, and I'm going to just make a little bit of observation. Okay? I am a firm believer that I cannot lose my salvation. Okay? I'm a firm believer in that. I believe that's what we find all through the Scriptures. Okay? But I will say this. There are people I know for sure that have made a profession of faith, but they have never possessed the Savior. There's a big difference. Anyone can pray a prayer from here, but if it doesn't reach here, that person has just professed they have not possessed. It, it cannot be just a head knowledge. I know God. In other words, I know I'm a sinner. Okay, that's good. I know that Jesus died for me. Okay, that's good. So far, we're talking about uh, profession. There hasn't been any possession yet. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Sure, I believe that. You know, the Bible says the devils even believe and tremble. My friend, there, there's no demon that's going to get saved. But he's professed that Jesus is the Son of God. He knows that J Jesus is the Savior. He's not going to heaven anytime soon, okay? No devil, no demon, no, no Satan himself. They all know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They profess that. But there's a big difference in profession. And then possession. It's something to say with the mouth. Yeah, I believe all those things. But then it has to be believing with the heart. And that's where I want to say tonight that sometimes I think we think, well, that person, surely they've lost their salvation. Look at how they're living. Now, we don't need to be, we don't need a room full of point, finger pointers, okay? But I'll say this. It's, it is true. That there's, I've said it before, the Bible tells us that it, it's very clear that someone that, that, that knows the Lord is going to be chastened. He chastens those whom he loves. If someone can run their life ragged and never be chastened by the Lord, I, I'm sorry, I, I wonder, did that person possess Christ or did he simply make a profession? Did it go from his head to his heart? I don't know. I'm just saying this. That, that I think many times we look at people and we say, well, they've lost their salvation. I would beg to differ. They never had it to begin with. It was a profession. It was coerced. It was, well, sure, I'll pray that just because I want to make that person feel good. My friend, that's not a convert. Somebody that prays and asks Jesus Christ to come into their heart to make the pastor feel good or to make the soul winner feel good is not necessarily saved. They've just done something to make someone else feel good. That's not true biblical salvation. Biblical salvation is, I know I'm a wicked sinner. 
Biblical salvation is I know Jesus Christ died for me on the cross and I want to I trust him as my savior. I might have tears, I might not have tears. The emotion isn't included in it, but it's a head knowledge that goes to the heart and says that without Christ, I am nothing, I am undone, and I'm headed straight for hell and I need to be saved. So we need to be careful. See, that's, that's where I think maybe some people get confused about this thing. And once somebody comes to that, and it goes from the head to the heart, they don't have to be emotionally stirred about it, but they might be. But they make that profession, and then they take the possession. They are then possessed by the Spirit of God. Amen. Now we have someone who's saved. And by the way, God has to draw that person. Too many times people are, have tried to sell Jesus. My friend, I know that's probably out of, a, out of a good heart, but we can't sell Jesus. I'm not a salesman. I'm an ambassador. I'm a representer of Jesus, not a salesman. I'm to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. This is the Bible. This is what it says. I'm to, how to, I'm to try to um, preach it and teach it to you to the best of my ability as God shows me. And, and I've, I've said things that weren't necessarily quite right, not out of a heart of, uh, of malice, but just uh, maybe just not saying it quite right. And I understand that. But the, the difference here is that, no, I can't lose my salvation I, because God cannot lie, because God's word clearly says that I can have eternal life, and because, number four, I have been sealed by the Spirit of God. That sealing of the Spirit of God comes when we truly trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's why, I'm, that's why almost every week we want to talk about someone, and, and, I, and I'll be very careful, but I had someone talk to me today, just today, that said, Pastor, pray for so-and-so. I'm not really sure if they're saved. And this is someone who, for all accounts, knows all the terms. They've crossed all the T's and they've dotted all the I's. But this person came to me and said, pray for them. It's someone very close to them. And they said, pray for them. I don't know if they're saved. I'm not trying to put doubt because, again, you can be sure you're saved, okay? And, eter- and, and salvation is eternal. That's why I'm saying make sure that you aren't just a professor of facts, but that you're a possessor of the Spirit of God. By the way, you'll know that you're a possessor of the Spirit of God because he bears witness of that. Um, you know, when, when you, um, let's, let's, let's think of this, when you say something you shouldn't say and then there's that, like, sword that kind of goes right under there under your ribs, guys. You know, said to your wife in the wrong tone, even in the wrong words, not just tone. You just blew it out of the water. And ooh, you felt that? You're, you're you know, and you knew, you know, you shouldn't do it. You don't revel in it. When, when, when you watch something and you and 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 and, it, and you watch something and you know you shouldn't be watching it, and the spirit of God beats you up for it. You shouldn't be watching this television program. We shouldn't be watching this movie. You say, Pastor, this is a lesson about eternal security, not about watching TV. Well, we can talk about that too. You listen to something, man, these, this music of today, my goodness. I don't even like hardly going into stores because the music is just a, it's a mess. And you listen to something and the Holy Spirit says, why are you listening to that? You're a Christian. This isn't God honoring. That's a good indication that you're saved. Why? Because the Lord chastens those whom he loves. Number five, our salvation is not determined by our feelings. It is determined by God's promises. If you've ever gone through our discipleship course that we used to use, those of you that have, you remember in lesson A, we have a picture of a train. The first, the first part of the train is the engine, and then there's a car, and then there's a caboose. And when we talk about assurance of salvation, the engine should be the facts of the word of God. And then the faith is the second car, and then the third car, the caboose, are the feelings. Many times, we want the feelings to be the engine. My friends, the feelings cannot be the engine. That's the facts of the Word of God. My faith is not in feelings. My my faith is in the facts of the Word of God. And praise God that eventually that caboose does come, and we do have some feelings that we're saved. We do have that feeling that God loves us. But that's not the engine. That's a byproduct of the engine. That's a byproduct of the faith in the facts of the word of God. So that's from the old series, but that's something I'll never forget. Faith in God's promises calms our feelings. So by way of uh, closure, why do people doubt their salvation? Oh, this is a tough one, isn't it? 
guilt from habitual sin. That's true. I said that earlier, didn't I? How can I be saved and still do this? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. All sin. There's no sin that you can't be cleansed from. And I can't be cleansed from. There is now, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm not condemned anymore. I'm under the blood of the lamb. Boy, what a blessing that is. But I'll tell you, that's where the devil gets us, isn't it? Continued sin. That's a big one. I'll tell you how you fix that. Walk in the spirit. Be filled with the spirit. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? And be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Be controlled by the spirit. That will help eliminate some of the sin in our life. We cannot remember the details of when we got saved. That may apply to you tonight. I'm not sure. Obviously, you don't have to know the date that you got saved. I mean, it, I would encourage you, if your children get sa- child gets saved, maybe to write a date down. But, um, you know, you don't have to know that. I know some people know day, month, year, second, minute. That's great. Number three, the devil tries to deceive us. We've talked about that, I believe, sufficiently tonight. And then because of false teachers. I'd encourage you to read through that passage of Scripture. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Seduce means to lead astray and deceive. Again, this is our foundation for faith and our practice. It's the word of God. I'll tell you this in closing. That thing about sin in our life. You know, God God wants you and God wants me to have victory over sin, doesn't he? Doesn't he? (laughs) Yeah, he does. God wants us to conquer the things in our life that are there. We're not going to conquer sin in the arm of the flesh. We can't do it. We have been possessed by the Spirit of God. We talked about that. So let me encourage you, church family. God is going with us every day. Whether we rely on him or not is our choice. And whether you have victory in your life boils down to your choices and my choices. It's not God's fault. And let me say this, it's not even the circumstances around us. If I'm victorious, it's because I relied on the Lord. If I'm defeated, it's because I didn't rely on the Lord. My problems might be smaller or bigger than yours. It doesn't matter. That's not, that's not, the, that's not the reason I fail or I succeed. The reason I have victory or I'm defeated is not whether my problems are bigger or smaller than yours. It's whether or not we are filled with the Spirit of God. And when we are filled with the Spirit of God and controlled by the Spirit of God, There's no temptation too great for us to overcome. Eternal security. I believe it's a biblical principle. I believe it's in the word of God. I believe it's something that you or I need to, maybe through this lesson and reading through this lesson and being reminded of something, that we need to have, we need to have comfort in that. Now, if you've never been saved, you're sitting here tonight and you say, you know what? You almost describe me to the T. I prayed a prayer just to please my mom and dad. You might want to search your heart. I made a decision just to, I'm not putting any doubt in your heart, I'm just saying. I, I made a decision to please my spouse. That's not biblical salvation. You trust the Lord Jesus Christ because you're convicted of the sin in your life. And you know that if you stood before a holy God, it would not be good. 
and that Jesus Christ died for you and loves you and you take upon him the robe, he gives you the robe of righteousness and you're saved. That's salvation. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you'll bless the invitation.